We play really beautiful football. Mitoma could pull back, great chance, goal! Brighton are back in it! Their very analytical and data-based uh, approach is special. So we know what league we're in, we know how difficult it is, but we are still very ambitious. We want to continue doing what we're doing. They play like always football with a lot of courage. And I think I want to continue this with my team. Brilliant squad of players with fantastic head coach. Yeah, what's not to like about being a Brighton fan at the moment? Brighton are the best run club in the Premier League. They finished sixth in the 2023 season, their highest ever finish, clinching European football for the first time ever. The next season, they topped their group in the Europa League, making it to the round of 16 and even reached the FA Cup semi-final. They did all of this while also turning a profit. A rare sight for a Premier League club. So how is it possible that despite losing very talented coaches in Potter and Deserby, selling their best player each season, the Seagulls continue to win games? Certainly, we don't have ceilings at this football club. Brighton follows a specific model and plan that is different to most clubs. Real Madrid, for example, likes to sign Galacticos, superstars to build their team around. Barcelona like to build their squad through the La Masia Academy, and Crystal Palace just like to sell their best player without ever replacing them. Brighton, however, uses a data analytical approach for their recruiting. Very much like an IT company, Brighton uses models and formulas to identify players at a low cost and then develop them into stars that are worth massive amounts of money. It's the numbers, it's the algorithms, it's the science of it all. It's how they identify talents like Basuma, Trossar, McAllister, and Caicedo before anyone else. It's a strategy that dates back to 2017 when the club secured promotions of the Premier League, their first time back in English football's top flight since 1983. You see, while we all now know Brighton as this modern, well-ran club, they don't have a long history of success. Founded in 1901, the Seagulls had only spent time in the first division from 1979 to 1983. They were then relegated, despite reaching the FA Cup final where they lost to Manchester United. From there, it was an up and down journey. They were relegated to Division 3 in 1987, then were promoted back the next season. In 1991, they lost the playoff final at Wembley to Notts County, only to be relegated the next season to the newly named Division 2. In 1996, further relegation came to Division 3. The club's financial situation was getting worse, especially in 1997 when they were forced to sell the Goldstone ground to pay off some of the club's large debts. The Goldstone ground has been sold to developers who will lease it back to Brighton for next season for £480,000 rent. It looked like Brian's 77 year league career was coming to an end. But they were saved by lifelong Brian fan Dick Knight. Under his ownership, Brian pulled out a miracle tie on the last match day against Hereford United to ensure they retained their league status. Brian had lived another day. We've had a dramatic day here at Hereford. They have gone down, but Brighton have survived. And I can tell you that as far as Brighton's history is concerned, this is probably one of the most important days in their lives. But Robbie Rhino scored the goal in the second half, which will send these fans home delirious because Brighton stay in the league. It's being in the football league that counts. You ask these boys behind me. Bryson had walked the tightrope and reached the other side. Knight appointed Mickey Adams as Brian's manager in 1999 and what a great decision that turned out to be. 2001 was Brian's first successful season in 13 years. They were crowned champions of Division 3 and promoted to Division 2. Even when Adams left, Brian maintained their form ending the season as Division 2 champions. Just 5 years after almost losing their football league status and going out of business completely, Brian were one division away from the Premier League. In 2009, the club changed hands once more to Tony Bloom for £80 million. Today, the Seagulls announced investment of up to £80 million by one man to finish paying for their new stadium. The benefactor is Tony Bloom. Businessman, property developer and professional poker player. And now, Tony Bloom also owns three quarters of Brighton and Hove Albion. It was Bloom's influence that led to the data analytical approach we see at the club now. How it's done, really. And what, what do you think the key thing you... Is it Tony Bloom? It's Tony Bloom. Yeah. Brighton now changed their strategy from primarily signing older domestic based players to scouting and recruiting young talented players from overseas markets. Brighton were also able to take on more risk now because Bloom was funding the club. He was a billionaire after transforming from a professional poker player to a property and private equity investor. Because Bloom was not only rich but passionate about the club, there was no urgency for the club to move on a certain number of players or to generate a specific amount of money. Bloom had never requested a repayment on his investment 
because he knew it was a long-term investment. That sort of patience and optimism is rare to see from a club owner. Bloom wasn't only bankrolling the club, but in 2006, he also founded sports betting company Star Lizard, which has since grown into an extremely extensive database containing information on thousands of players around the world. Bloom coupled his statistical analysis knowledge with his history of gambling to create a football data analysis business. The database uses an algorithm not just to identify players, but coach it. It's how the club was able to replace Potter with Deserbi, then replace the Italian with Fabian Hertzler the youngest manager in Premier League history. The algorithm's formula is a closely kept secret, but clearly it works. Moises Caicedo was identified as a top talent for only 4.5 million pounds, then sold just two years later for 115 million pounds to Chelsea. Mark Cucurea was brought in for 15.4 million pounds from Getafe, then sold for 63 million pounds to Chelsea. McAllister was bought for 7 million pounds, then sold for 55 million to Liverpool. These are players bought from all over the globe, bought for small fees, then developed into stars. Ongoing, so we're monitoring, you know, all the leagues, all the players in the world in terms of we've you know, got a database system. I think yeah. everybody's aware of that now. What makes the algorithm unique is that Brian looked for a specific profile of player rather than a specific name. The first step in the recruitment is always positional need. For example, the manager states that he wants a winger that is good in 1v1 situations. So they use the algorithm to look for players who have a high percentage of beating their man, high number of 1v1 take-ons. They use the data to find a set of players. So what we as a club like, but also the coach has got a you know, have an input and a say into that as well and, and work together to get, you know, people that, you know, we both think can help us and improve us. Then they watch the players to eye test and verify their data. Then of course they meet the player individually to make sure that his personality is a right fit for the coach and for the club as a whole. This is how they were able to defeat Manchester United with a starting 11 that cost less than what United paid just for Anthony. All clubs of course use data to a certain extent, but Brian focuses a lot more on the analysis of data rather than scouts. This allows them to identify talents that earn playing in the biggest markets quicker than anyone else. For example, while some clubs might be scouting in Spain and Italy, Brian scouts will be in the Belgian league or a smaller European league. While clubs like Real Madrid are scouting heavily in Brazil for the likes of Endrick or the next Vinicius Jr., Brian is scouting in places like Ecuador and Paraguay. But that's not the only reason that Brian is able to attract talents. While they have turned some unknown players into superstars, many of the players on their team were already on the radar of big clubs before. Evan Ferguson, for example, had caught the eyes of Liverpool and Chelsea at an early age. New big signing Minte was on every team's radar after his terrific performances with Feyenoord. Same thing with Valentin Barco, a highly sought after Argentinian talent from Boca Juniors. So if you are a super young, talented player who can choose from any club in the world, why choose the Seagulls? I think Brian just had a, a different feel to it. A big draw for Brian is their ability to provide minutes for younger players. Playing time is a valuable commodity for young talent. And at Brian, you know when you sign, you will play football. Now, it won't necessarily be with the first team right away. And that's when the next step of Brian's strategy comes into play. Brian purchases a lot of players for small fees and then offers them a development program to ensure that they continue to get playing time and improve. They do this by using the loan market and multi-club ownership. When they sign a player, they usually have a plan for their development in the form of a loan. It's very rare for a young player to sign for Brian and then play for them in the same season. Matoma is one example. He was statistically one of the best players in Japan, so Brian signed him and instantly loaned him out to Belgian side Union SG a club that Tony Bloom is a shareholder of. That situation with Union, how do you feel that's gone? Because obviously it's not unique, but you were one of the sort of first people to set up that kind of system and working with players at both clubs and then coming here. How, how do you feel that's worked for you and, and for them as well? We trust them, so we've we've loaned players out and that, that's gone very well. The player develops there, has a couple of successful seasons, then is integrated into the first team. Doing this also allows them to have a backup ready for whenever one of their star players decides to leave. For example, when Trossard wanted to move to Arsenal, Brian weren't worried because the whole time they had been developing his replacement in Matoma. Who knows, if Matoma was to leave, they can just integrate Barco into the club after he has developed on loan. McAllister left and he was replaced by Matt O'Reilly from Celtic. Caicedo left and now they're developing Baliba. The characteristic of Baleva, uh, I think, can, can be the, 
the great replacement of uh, Moise Casado. When Kukurea left, they replaced him with Estupinian. This analytical model also works for coaches. When Potter left to take over Chelsea, many thought that Brent would struggle, but Potter was happily replaced. Roberto De Zerbi came in and instantly made an impact, catapulting them into a Europa League spot and finishing higher than Chelsea in the process. The other coach on Brighton's radar at the time was Ange Postacoglu, who as we are seeing at Tottenham would have been a fantastic signing. This approach also means that if a coach leaves, the next person in charge can still benefit from the players at his disposal. That's because Brighton has a philosophy for the whole club. They want to play quick, direct, entertaining football that wins matches. So even though De Zerbi left, Fabian Hertzler plays almost the same style. I like the, the style that they want to play. It's like always with courage and uh, me and my team, we try to continue this. He was a manager who checked all the right boxes for Brian. Fabian's name came out there given what he did over the last 18 months at St. Pauli. And you know when we went through it, he was the, the, the standout candidate. He overperformed probably with uh, the level of players he had. So that's obviously appealing to us that yeah. people that can make the most out of what they've got. Yeah. He overachieved with Sao Paulo in Germany, is able to get the most out of existing players while also working on a tight budget and plays courageous football. It's why players like Matoma, Ferguson, João Pedro continue to perform well. It's pretty much the complete opposite of what United does. United brings in multiple different managers all with different philosophies and styles. So when one of them leaves or gets sacked, the new manager is stuck with players at his disposal on high wages who don't even fit his style. Thanks to Bloom and Brian's chief operations officer in Paul Mullen, Brian has also invested in infrastructure off the pitch. They have a state-of-the-art training facility and the Amex Stadium, while small, is a great environment to be in for home game. Everything looks great for Brian, but the question will always be, how sustainable is this model? Can they continue to offload their top talents every single season while still getting results? Every year, big clubs are going to be lurking around not just their players, but their staff, and even trying to copy their algorithmic model. Southampton had a similar model a decade ago, developing talents like Bale, Lallana, Van Dijk, and Mane. They weren't able to maintain their success. Only time will tell, but one thing is for sure. Brighton are one of the most exciting teams to watch in the world of football. While Brighton didn't end up getting Ange Postacoglu, the Australian has been killing it with his new Tottenham team. To check out their progress, you have to see this video right here.